Hey, this is Matt, the host of the show. And before we get started with this week's episode, I have one quick announcement. Jay, who runs the Southampton page, the official partner page of the podcast, is on the show this week. We have some additional news uh, that we didn't talk about in the episode. And that is the Southampton page is launching its very own YouTube channel. So if you are a fan of what the Southampton page has done on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, or you're a fan of match day vlogs, away day experiences, and other videos of that sort, then this is kind of the perfect match for you. So head over to YouTube, search for the Southampton page, and make sure you subscribe. The first video is already there. Jem uh, gives a nice intro to what the channel will be all about, and regular content will start flowing this weekend when we visit Brighton. There are links to the channel in the show notes below, so with just a few taps or clicks, you can be subscribed to be sure that you don't miss any of the videos they have coming. So with that said, let's get to the episode with Jay. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. You're listening to the Southampton Delivery P -P -P Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. If you want to have guarantees, you have to buy a washing machine. We don't lose a match, either we win or we learn, and today we learn. And now, your host, Matt Markstone. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast and newsletter dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. Available right here on SouthamptonDelivery.com. My name is Matt Marks and I am the host of the show. And no matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thanks for making the show part of your day. I hope you enjoy it. And we lost. No points through two games. It's not time to freak out. We were close. We had chances. We played well for majority of the game. We'd expect Danny Ings to get a touch on that. You would expect maybe one of the guys after him to clean it up. You would expect us to not lose the ball from our own throw-in. You would expect, I don't know, maybe maybe you'd expect Roberto Firmino to, to put away his chance as well, uh, or for Milner's chance to kind of hit the inside of the post and go in instead of going by just wide. Um, there were a lot of things. I, overall, I just thought it was a really good game of football. It was something that I actually really enjoyed watching which is more than we could say for the majority of the past couple of seasons. But the truth is we need some points and things will have to turn around a little bit. Results will have to go our way, but I think there is something to build on there and it will be a real test if we can do it against a team that is not at the top. Uh, so I think sometimes saints do a much better job of uh, getting after teams who are at the top of the game. We seem to be able to pick ourselves up for those games now you think back even under Puel and Pellegrino, we were able to do those things, but uh, I think there's something different here. So we will see. And this week uh, on the show to help me kind of figure all of this out is Jay from the Southampton page, as I mentioned in the announcement before. Uh, there's a YouTube channel the Southampton page has. So if you if you skipped over that, because some people just have it set to come, you know, a minute in. So I, hello, you can click the link in the show notes below and head over to the Southampton page's new YouTube channel. Uh, there's good stuff there for you, but, um, uh, overall just pretty excited uh, to do this. Um, there is, there are some interruptions. There's some background noise because my son turned 14. Uh, he had a group of people over. We were supposed to record this while they were asleep. They stayed up till 5.00 AM. Um, Jay and I were set to record about 5.30, uh, and then the power went out. And so, uh, we could not do that. So by the time we finally got to do it, there were people around, they were up, they were being picked up, there's noise, and there's nothing we can do about it. But I hope uh, I hope it doesn't distract you too much. And really, I just hope you enjoy the show. So enough of this. Let's get to the show. It's already lengthy as it is. Here's my conversation with Jay, who runs the Southampton page, the official partner page of the show. Thanks for listening. We like to welcome back to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, Jay Grant. Jay runs the Southampton page on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. They are the official partner page of the podcast. And uh, 
I'm coming to you live from my house, which sounds more probably like, um, I'm not sure where, but a public place, which is not. Um, but Jay, I have recorded with you uh, in a public place, I think next to a river at one point um, when we were on vacation, I think also in from a hotel room. But uh, today my son has had a bunch of his friends spend the night because of his birthday and uh, they are currently being picked up. And uh, that's what you're hearing in the background, but it's okay. But uh, anyway, how are you, man? Yeah, not too bad. Um, a bit looking at the uh, Premier League tables a bit fun in the last uh, couple of days. But yeah, apart from that, not too bad. I, uh, I haven't looked and I won't look. I don't want to look until uh, maybe the first international break or maybe after, maybe the first game back after that. Maybe after five games, I will, I will give it a look. But um, I, I mentioned before, people can get a hold of you uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook and just tell people kind of what they can expect if they go to the page uh, just so they have some idea of what to expect. Yeah, well, um, on Twitter, we do cover, we cover the game. Um, we try and do ranges of news that people don't see on there. On Facebook, it's basically just news articles. And Instagram is all build up to games during the week. Obviously, we do your match graphics on a Friday. So, yeah, we basically we do different things. And we've got loads of different people. Well, there's three of us. Sorry, four of us at the moment doing work on there. So, yeah, it's quite um, quite busy sometimes during the season. But that's what we like, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it keeps it keeps us all engaged in what's going on in the in, in, around scenes and around the game and stuff like that. And, and it actually helps me do the show, I think, because otherwise, I sometimes I do. I wish I could just switch off and not pay attention for a week. But then when it comes time to do the show, it's kind of like, well, what happened? You know, and you miss all of the kind of stuff that goes on. So it really does help uh, me, and I and I enjoy it. And I think you guys all do a, a great job. Everybody that's involved. So um, that is that is good. But. Um, I mean, in terms of the match this week, it was always going to be tough against Liverpool. Uh, European champions, uh, Super Cup champions, they had, you know, they did have to play 120 minutes, and we we kind of all thought that might help uh, us a little bit, especially in preseason, but or in early in the season, I should say. But um, I don't know. I think overall we played all right, and we'll, we'll get into that in just a just a second here. But um, I mean, should we should we start then just with the lineup and and how House and Hoodle chose to set the team up. I think the, the big change there is, is Hoiberg was obviously fit to play from the beginning. He wasn't sick. Uh, and then the inclusion of Yoshida uh, for Stevens, I think was uh, not surprising. I think it was surprising not to have it last week, but uh, is that, is that, I mean, were you happy with that selection? Yeah. Last week I was actually hoping that Yoshida was going to start. Cause I look at the back three, how it is. And I think it's quite good actually, but um, Danzo, is getting ready to get included. I know Ralph said during a press conference on Thursday that he's trying to slowly get him in to the team because obviously him and Gineppo have both arrived late. Adams had the luxury of pre-season. So, but yeah, I think Yoshida starting was a good move and I'm hoping that we get to see him more often with the inclusion of Danzo in the coming weeks. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that, how that works out. And I woke up uh, quite late yesterday. I kind of was up like 10 minutes before kickoff. So I... I didn't really study the lineup. Uh, I just kind of looked at who was in there. I saw Yoshida, I saw Hoiberg, and went like, okay, here we go. I, I did notice, though, that Danny Ings wasn't starting. And I think that comes down to, to formation. We had kind of a, defensively, we had a, almost a, a 5-3-2. And then I think going forward, it was a little bit more of a of a 3-4-3 with uh, Ward Prowse pushing up a little bit, maybe. But um, I think Ings didn't really fit that if you wanted to have that extra man in midfield. Uh, when we were trying to defend, so I think that that turned out to be okay. Uh, I thought George, I thought Ward Prowse played played just fine, and then you know Ings came on late to uh, to to score a goal, and I thought that was also good. But um, anybody else on the bench uh, kind of shock you a little bit? Um, well, I was a bit. I don't know not not a lot of people will probably be bothered by this. I was a bit surprised to see Forster on the bench actually, because I'm, I'm guessing there's a I'm guessing he's trying to rotate McCarthy and Forster at the moment on the bench, and I would have said. I'm surprised Shane Long hasn't featured at all this season. I don't know if he's out of plans at the moment or he feels that Opafemi is ahead of him at the moment. So, yeah, I'm, uh, apart from that, though, I think the bench... Oh, and Cedric, of course, was on the bench as well. But I think, yeah, the main two for me it was no Shane Long because I thought he might feature and Fraser Forster being on the bench. Yeah, I mean, some people thought Long would actually start this game given how we we set up to play and instead we set up to play I think slightly differently we didn't really go long with it we but we did press and 
um, I don't know. I thought I, I was I was overall pretty happy, even though um, both Adams and Ings wound up missing chances that you would have hoped they would have put away. You know, and that's it's almost the the similar problem that we've had in 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 recent seasons where we didn't have somebody to do that, but only we know they can both do it, and they just didn't convert yesterday. But that's that's the way it goes. Um, so let's let's I, I guess move on from there. Um, I mean, did you notice yesterday every time? Van Dyke was on the ball. Could you could you hear the booze? Um, I must admit, it didn't seem as bad as what I thought it was going to be. But I'm, I think booing's silly. I used to be. I think it's probably because I've grown up a little bit. But I used to think booing was a like I thought if people boo, people boo, whatever. But I think Van Dyke being the character he is, it wouldn't affect him anyway. And as much as people don't like Van Dyke, and I'm, I'm not really. I haven't really got any view on him. I mean, he's left. That's it. He's not one of ours anymore. But I think it wouldn't phase him, and he would rather get the victory through his post after saying we've won, and that's it. That's him feeling vilified. I don't know if that's the right word, or if anyone does boo him. But and it's not, and it's all, always a small minor, minority. So I don't think it affects him really, does it? No, I don't. I don't think it does. I think he's he's used to that, and he's. I mean. I mean, he should be so focused on the game that he doesn't hear much of it. And it's, it like you said, it wasn't the whole stadium and it's not, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I think he's just able to, to kind of block that out and play. And he, he plays such a calm kind of collected game that you don't, you wouldn't think it really bothers him that much. It doesn't seem to anyway. Um, but I mean, overall, like right from the start, were you pretty impressed with how, how into the game Saints were and how up for it they were from the very start? Yeah, I mean, I was expecting us to be up for it because I didn't think I mean we knew it would get better than Burnley I mean it couldn't get any worse so we knew something was going to happen and despite the fact that Liverpool did go on to win the game you could tell they'd done that game midweek and it does kind of bug me because I think we could have got something from that because it ended 2-1 we could have easily as you alluded to with the Adams and obviously the Ings chance, which I can't believe he missed. I don't know if you saw that. The, it was his the one where it literally went across the goal and he somehow... Uh-huh. Did, I mean, everyone would say they would have put it in, but I mean, you're in that... But I think he should have really scored that and we could have gone away with a point and everyone would have been like, not, not too bad. Yeah, I, we were we were a, a couple of touches away from, from potentially either winning the game or, or at least tying it up, uh, coming out of there with a point, which I think we would have been very, very happy with. Uh, but Liverpool also had a couple of shots to, that, you know, just skirted wide. I think uh, oh, there's the the doorbell again. Um, I think uh, Milner went just wide. I think Firmino went wide on one that you would have expected him to put away. So, I mean, maybe the result is fair, um, but I thought we played much much better than we had in uh, against Burnley, obviously. And you, you, my only my only concern, I guess, coming out of it is if if it's the I don't know. I, I guess if it's just that we were able to get up because it was Liverpool, or if Ralph has the team ready to play like that each and every week, you know. And obviously Liverpool's style uh, of, of possession and 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 trying to play it out from the back that plays into our hands. It allows us to press, and um, they have a keeper there who's not as comfortable on, on the ball as we saw when uh, early on, where Pross was able to close Adrian down and uh, you know block the block his his clearance or whatever. But we just went wide and not into the goal and. Of course, things got there later and, and managed to put it in. But um, I was pretty, I was pretty impressed with uh, uh, how the team kind of went about their business. I think. Yeah, um, that's the other thing that really, actually, another thing I'm thinking about. Adrian was not good at all. Well, he he done okay, but I, you could tell from the early stages he was nervous, and it was a big plus for me that Allison was out of the game because he's a great goalkeeper as much as people. Don't like, probably wouldn't like me praising Liverpool on the podcast, but he is a good keeper. So I thought Adrian needed to be pressured more. And I think he, well, with the Ings chance, you saw he wasn't comfortable in goal. I mean, he wasn't, that, he was linked with him what, just before the window. He signed for him and then he was, he's their number one now. So I just think we should have put more pressure on him. Yeah, well, he was, I think he was playing in like the sixth division of Spain or training with the sixth division of team in Spain. So, I mean, he obviously... Uh, he, I mean, he showed exactly what he's capable of. He had some brilliant stops yesterday, but also he is he is air prone. Um, he gave away a penalty midweek. He cost them a goal yesterday. So it's it's uh, 
it's going to be tough to see Liverpool really keeping pace with Manchester City. Uh, although I say that Manchester City dropped points yesterday, but uh, to do that in in um, if he's going to make those errors, so they I think if they get through this period, they will be uh, get Allison back. I think they'll be they'll be all right. But the, there was a couple of shots on TV yesterday where uh, Van Dyke was not happy with Al. Uh, sorry, with Adrian for. Um, the way he kind of took and the, the time he took to get the ball clear and things like that. It wasn't great. So, um, but a, a couple of things though, there early on, there was a, uh, that run from Adams where Redmond kind of got the ball out wide, put the ball over the top and it looked like Virgil van Dyke did just enough to kind of shove Adams off the ball. Uh, Adrian came out and claimed the ball, but I mean, that was a very clear moment for us that we could cause them trouble because Redmond's pass takes Matip completely out of the play. Um, they that run from deep caused it, it should have been matchups, man, I think, and it forced Van Dyke to come across. So um, overall, like right away, I think it was pretty pretty clear that we were there and we had a game plan as to how to attack them, and, and I think we did a pretty good job of it. Yeah, and most people would have probably put us down for a big loss, to be fair. So to, okay, yes, we lost, and the result obviously wasn't the best for us, and people are feeling a bit gloomy, but I don't think we should be too down about it it's like you alluded to at the beginning they're a team that have won the champions league and they won the super cup they've they've got they've nicked half of our team so <laughs> yeah yes yeah. I mean, what can we say yeah yeah and and uh alex oxley chamberlain was back yesterday for for the first time in, in a long time after a lengthy injury spell out and um he there were a couple of times he ran into the box and, and got away from Bertrand sometimes. And I think there's a, there's still a little bit of confusion that our back line still doesn't have the leadership there that I think we need. Um, it was better with Yoshida. We looked more comfortable, but still uh, there were times when, when the front three and then even the midfielders for Liverpool were finding space. And that was, that's, it's concerning, but I, I guess it's bound to happen when you're facing a team as, as good as they are. Um, I, I thought that we really, you know, uh, through 12 minutes into the game, it was 70-30 possession, but we had created, I think, the better chance through through Adams. Um, I think Gunn had, had one stop at that point. Um, but Milner had to go off uh, to get treatment. He had to get a stitch in his eye. Um, and I think at that point, when it was... It, when we were, we were a man up, essentially, I thought that we really grew into the game. And from that point on, even when Milner came back, I thought we were the better team for the rest of the half. Yeah, uh... Yeah, I think that's. I didn't think we played too badly, really. It was just. I put it on Twitter last night. I can quickly grab what I put. Basically, put in my own. I I just basically put that. Um, oh, I can actually use arms quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um. No, I just put that Liverpool's quality showed yesterday. It was. Um. We. I said we didn't play too badly, but it was. It's the. It shows the difference in in us. Do you know what I mean? The difference between us. But yeah, um, but no, it was just the we wanted an improvement. We got that. Um, I said Liverpool had just before the break. Liverpool had that chance. Mane, you can't give him that room. But but this, the problem is we're still talking about the defence, which is we've been talking about this for years, and I'm still worried about it. I must admit, every time we go into a game, I think who's starting this time? We need a solid back line. We need to get it sorted. But otherwise, there will be problems in every game. And Brighton next week is a massive game for us because we need that result. So I think it's crucial that we pick the right defence for that. Otherwise, that could be a mess. I mean, they're, they're sitting on four points and four goals so far this season. So they've, they've, they've looked good. And I think that would have been one of the one of the teams that we would have said, hey, maybe that's a, a, a team that we can beat. You know, next year going forward, we would have thought we could, we could compete with them. And, and then we, that's a team we should be beating. And it'll be it'll be a tough way to i think it normally is when when we, when we go down there but um but yeah i mean we'll, we will uh look forward to that i mean you'll have match uh stuff building up to it and and we'll have the newsletter coming out later in the week kind of uh previewing it hopefully um but i i wanted to go back to uh to, to milner and we'll, and we'll get to more on the on the defense there but um when between the time that milner went off and and he came back on at least in my notes is what i have it was um Redmond managed to win a corner. Romeo had set him free, kind of, and the Ox just kind of uh, did a great job to. Uh, he conceded the corner, but stood stood Redmond up and didn't let him get the ball into the box. Didn't let him kind of beat him and get a shot away. Um, the court from the corner, um, the corner comes in, kind of goes all the way through 
uh, a couple of bobbles. Adams winds up putting a shot in, uh, and that's when Vestergaard just doesn't quite get enough of a touch on it, and it goes just wide. Uh, so another 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 chance there, um, and then we get another corner uh, that results, I think, from uh, at one point Vestergaard played that long diagonal to Valerie, which we did we've done did this several times last week as well uh, against Burnley, but played that long diagonal. Uh, Valerie got the ball into the box, and then eventually we win a corner. And from that corner is when uh, Yoshida gets up over Van Dyke and um, manages to to get that ball uh, on, on frame. Just Adrian makes a good save, and and all of that happened in that in that moment when we were a man up, which I think is really nice to see us taking advantage of something like that and being kind of ruthless with it. I think. Yeah, and that's the good thing about Yoshida. I mean, to get above Van Dyke is quite a feat in itself, and he's always. We've known over the years, if Yoshida's in the box with a corner, he can get he scores plenty of goals over the years, and it's a shame for him. He made all that effort, and sadly, Adrian wasn't uh, feeling clamorous and didn't let him score. But <laughs> yeah, well, and and I think some people will point out that I don't think Van Van Dyke was not man marking him on that. Uh, somebody else was, and Van Dyke was having uh, was was marking space. I guess so. The combination of zonal and man marking and. Um, anyway, he just never got a chance to get up. Yoshida beat him to it, and it was a great, a great header. It just happened to uh, to hit Adrian, unfortunately. But um, you know, unfortunately, we couldn't convert in that moment. But it was we we definitely made ourselves. Uh, we were we were pressing them back, which is not what anybody would have would would have expected. And whether it was because there was only, they only had ten men and they were missing a midfielder, or because they had played 120 minutes midweek, or whatever it was, uh, the truth is that we played and looked much much better during that time. Um, and unfortunately we just couldn't make the set pieces count. Um, one thing that I did notice on, on our coverage here in the States is, is you could hear Ralph encouraging the players, pushing them on, whether it was talking to Prowsey or Valerie on that side, uh, for a lot of the, a lot of the first half, um, he was constantly encouraging them. And I don't know if it shows up. I mean, I know you guys couldn't watch it in the UK, uh, but I don't know if it showed up on the radio broadcast or not, probably not, but um, it was really nice and encouraging to hear because it it was it didn't sound angry it didn't sound uh, you know th- there were times last year when you heard Mark Hughes and it always sounded like he was just one step away from just yelling at the guys you know and so for for that to happen I thought was 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 really really good but um, I also thought that our pressing caused Liverpool a lot of problems and I thought that that was a good sign because if we are if we can do that to a team that is as good as Liverpool is. Um, if there are teams that try to play through us uh, as the season goes on that are not as good, the quality of players is not there, I think I think we will continue to cause them even more problems and hopefully be able to convert from some of those chances. No, they were talking on the fans' forum on Thursday about Ralph. Um, so obviously we know his number two left for Bayern uh, a couple of weeks back and the, and the key for him to get someone in alongside him because when obviously he's got his coaches around him, but I think he needs that partner alongside him to help him but the pressing is I mean our pressing's always been good under Ralph and he's always encouraging and I think it's good for him but I think like I said it's essential for him and he said it himself that getting a number two in the near future is is essential for him too I think just to help him out a bit yeah initially I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal my one concern was over the fact that that Ralph already seems like a guy who will work himself into the ground. Like he's never going to stop working. And if you take the stuff that, that Danny Robe was doing and you just add it to Ralph's plate, like, is that going to be too much for him? Is he going to miss details here and there just because he's being overworked? And, and I understand the desire to, to work and, and work hard. I, 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 I admire that in Ralph and I, I appreciate that. Um, but I also sometimes those people tend to have uh, the inability to say, well, actually, I do need someone here. I do need a little bit of help, you know. And so I hope I hope that um, that is all being cleared up behind the scenes that uh, maybe maybe some of the other coaches are taking on a little a little bit of added responsibility. Maybe you take Danny Roll's jobs and you spread them out amongst the other coaches. so Everybody does one or two little things extra and that makes it, um, you know, workable. Um, but uh, I did see some people on Twitter and elsewhere just kind of saying that, that 
uh, Hassan Hudel maybe looked a little isolated on the sideline. Like he didn't have somebody there next to him at the right time to say, hey, here's this or here's that. But I did think that actually Ralph did a better job this week in managing the game than he did last week. Yeah, a lot of people were very um, critical of his selection. I was as well. I mean, it's you're not allowed to be that critical about him because obviously everyone says about it. But sometimes a manager needs... Like I said, he's the manager and I trust him 100%. This week, I think he got it much better. Um, it's... And I said, just managing the game at the time and looking who the opponent is and how, I mean, he's getting it right. Like with Brighton, I'm sure we'll go a little bit different. I'm sure Ings will come back in the lineup or, and whatnot. So it's just, it's just sometimes it's, it's how you, def- it's how you take the game. It's like how important you think the game is to you with your selection. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we will, we will have to see how it kind of, it kind of looks going forward, but um, getting back to kind of our, our, uh, our performance in the first half, there were a couple of scrambles where Liverpool couldn't get it away, where we constantly had it in the box. We never really got necessarily a, a shot that forced Adrian to make a save, but we got, we had guys kind of scuffing shots and getting shots blocked and getting crosses blocked and uh, getting balls into the box that were headed away. And it, the, the, I, I, mean, I think it's worth saying again, it's just, we were a hundred percent different than when we played uh, against Burnley. And I would say that the one big negative, um, of the first half, uh, up until Mane scored, of course, was uh, was Mariner giving Oriol Romeu a totally undeserved yellow card. Um, and I just have written here, Mariner gives Romeu a totally undeserved yellow card for a clean tackle. Like, way to go. Thanks for... And that's our defensive midfielder that is... Um, you know, and, and he... Uh, Romeu deserves a lot of yellow cards. I think he earns them just fine, and he's fine with having them. But that was one of those instances where I don't think that was necessarily great and i thought mariner made a t- uh quite a few mistakes yesterday um and i'm not sure uh, at times it just looked like he was watching a different game you know i don't i don't know yeah no that's well i mean romeo is normally i mean name a better duo than romeo in a yellow card i think mariner likes that duo and he decided to give <laughs> romeo a yellow card for a good tackle which surprises me but then Mariner's always been a bit controversial because I'm sure, if I'm not mistaken, and, and people, and I'm sure Arsenal fans, if if any Arsenal fan listens, obviously he booked the wrong player. Mm-hmm. So that was him, was it? I think I think it was. Uh, well, I'm he sure we'll, I'm sure somebody will let us know uh, yeah, sure who who it was if that. it wasn't him. But um, moving forward from there, um, you know, talk about defense and back lines and things like that. There was uh, an instance where Gunn came over the top to claim a ball over VVD, which I enjoyed watching Um, things like that. That just shows his confidence. And I think the fact I I enjoyed a little bit more simply because it was, was Van Dyke. Um, There was another chance though, kind of Romeo responded to that yellow card. Um, He had already played a, a similar ball for Redmond, but he played a ball in for Adams from deep. Uh, another deep run from Adams that um, Adams headed just high, you know, and it was one of those things where if just the early chance that he had, the the chance from Vestergaard, uh, the header from Yoshida, that, that I mean, we could have been uh, up by multiple goals going into to halftime. And I think that might have, you know, I don't know how Liverpool re- would have responded. And it's, I guess it's no use to to kind of uh, pretend like we could figure it out. But like that, that chance is what you you would have hoped that we brought Adams in for, and and hopefully he begins to convert those as 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 we move forward from here. Yeah, I, I tell you, I mean after uh, it's a bit of a weird one actually because of how well we done on pre season, everyone I think is expecting him to be, you know, what I mean Wonder Man sort of thing. But um, yeah, it's it's gonna take him a while. He's, I mean, no offense to Birmingham, but he's been playing in a poor Championship side. It's stepped up a little bit more for him. I, this season, it's just it, he wait, he's waiting for that chance. I think once he gets his first goal, I think he'll he'll be on the track. He's definitely got the talent there, and we can see he can score. Like I said during preseason, like I said Premier League's totally different ball game, but give him time, get get a couple of goals, and hopefully we'll uh, get out, get away from where we are at the moment. Yeah, it's early days, but. You know. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, we're two games in. Uh, I think the only concern would be that Timu Puki, I think, has four goals now, and you know, we're we're well behind that, but that's that's fine. Um, as we headed towards halftime, were you at all worried that 
they were going to strike late and kind of steal the momentum from us as like, like they did? Or were you thinking that we were going to go into halftime having been the better team uh, and, and being level with, with Liverpool, which I think we probably would have been okay with. Um, I actually thought, I must admit, listening, listening into it, I was thinking them scoring was actually bad for us, really, because I saw, I don't know if you saw what I saw, but when they come out on the halftime break, they didn't look as good as I thought they would have looked at coming out with a nil-nil. Um, I was hoping we got to halftime break with nil-nil, get Ralph to have an art, because Liverpool weren't the best in the first half, so for them to get that goal was a bit like, oh, but the confidence when we started the second half showed that that goal sort of ruined it for them. But I like, like I said, I'm not sure if you saw that, but I thought we looked a bit leggy coming out after that. Yeah, we we didn't. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess that watching the team when you put in that amount of effort and when you come away with nothing to show for it, and you go into the break behind knowing that you just gave everything and it wasn't good enough, like that's not a time to hang your head because you've, you've done everything you can. But at the same time, it's hard to go like, okay, 45 more minutes more of, of this, you know, I'm going to do all of this running. I'm going to put on all of these tackles. I'm going to be unfairly punished by the referee. Um, you know, we're going to have this stuff kind of go against us and yet we're going to keep going. And that's hard to, it's hard to do. And um, I, I thought that early on in the second half, especially uh, there was a good chance that Liverpool were going to blow us away because we couldn't get out of our own half, you know, uh, we we were we lost the possession battle, of course, uh, in the first half as well. But we looked a lot better in the second half. They were all over us. Most of the pit, most of the match was played in in our in our half, I think, and and they were attacking and uh, creating some chances from it. But um, I think early on, again, uh, Mariner called Ori Romeo for a foul. Um, it was harsh on him again, um, and then they kind of from there just kind of stepped it up and. Uh, you know, Bednarak had to come across and make a, a kind of an awkward challenge on Firmino to knock the ball away, uh, to keep him from having a shot. Um, and I don't know. And, and, and going forward, I think that there were several instances where uh, Adams had the ball out wide or Redmond had the ball and there was nobody in the box because we had been pinned back so far that uh, we couldn't we couldn't actually generate anything offensively. And I think that's that's the danger. If we can't get uh, guys forward if we get pressed back that far, then we're, we're in some serious trouble. Yeah. That's, that's I said, well, and I said, going back to the, uh, you said about Marin, I, I, I was hoping he was, he was going to book someone else to be honest. <laughs> and that's the reason probably why Romeo had to be a bit more calmer with that. Because once you get a yellow card, you can't really go in with a chance. All he would have to have done was tackled once more and he would have been red carded. Sure. And I thought, I actually thought that Romeo played just fine with the yellow card and sometimes he does a little bit better, but um, he did, he does have, he did have to be extra careful, but I thought he played, I thought he played just, just, just fine there. Um, yeah. and, and here's where we get to some of those chances we talked about with, with Liverpool earlier. I know we had the better chances in the first half and we went, you know, whether it's Adams or, or Vestergaard or, or whoever, just not being able to get the final touch. Um, Liverpool had a run of shots where a run of play where they had several chances. They, they had Milner go just wide uh, Gunn came up with that big save against Salah 1v1. Uh, it's one of those times where you expect Salah to put it away. Um, I will not lie. I had Salah as the captain of my fantasy team. So not a great day for me fantasy wise, but that's, uh, you know, I would have, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad he didn't score. I'm glad Gunn came up with a save. Um, and, and I just kind of thought that maybe we ran ourselves into the ground and, in the first half and we weren't going to be able to, to, to do it again in the second. Um, and it seemed like there was a couple of opportunities again where Liverpool just had what seemed to be three or 300 passes or so uh, around the box and into the box and, and things like that. And finally, uh, you know, we had to make some sort of a change and, and try to get back into it. And that's, a, you know, that's when Ralph made the change for Romeo for Ings. And I thought that was uh, good to see. And it, it, it it, it caused us to change a little bit how we were set up, and I thought we looked a lot better after that. Yeah, Ings must have been devastated because everyone was talking about the fact that he was playing against his old side for the first time. And to be on the bench, you knew Ings would come on with fire in his belly, and that's what you want from a substitute. And obviously he went on to make an impact. But yeah, I think him coming on helped. But then I was slightly surprised, I must admit, and I'm guessing it sort of work that Adams come off not far out. I was hoping they were going to keep them together and make more 
because I think that sort of affected it a little bit. But obviously, that's my opinion against other people's opinions. But I thought Adams coming off, he should have stayed on a bit longer. But I thought that they could have worked well up there. I think maybe Ralph just had seen him kind of run himself into the ground. You know, run him. He Adams did a lot of running. He was chasing. He was both Shane Long in it. He was chasing long balls into the channels. He was holding the ball up. He was pressing. He was doing all of those things. And and so for him to to do that and Maybe, you know, maybe he just didn't look like he quite had the, the touch yesterday where he wasn't going to be able to maybe uh, get the ball in the goal. So may, maybe that's the, the reason for the change and to bring on Armstrong for him. Right. Um, I think that was I think that was OK. I think Armstrong played well and it gave us some fresh legs and also somebody who could orchestrate a little bit, um, who could pick a pass that would that would get um, Ings or Redmond into into some space to to, to get a shot away. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I thought it, I thought it was uh, you know you like to see them play together, and I think they will. I think we will see that. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see how how Hassan Hudel does it um, to get make kind of him Redmond, uh, Ings Redmond Adams, and then you look at what Janapo, Where is he going to play? Uh, and, and figure out kind of how that all how that all works. But I mean, despite all that, the the changes come, and Firmino then puts uh, Liverpool up. Two, two to nothing, and and this is where I think the defensive lapse comes in. And this is where the same kind of problems that have plagued us all season, and for la- not all season, but the last couple of seasons, I would say, um, comes back to 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 kind of show itself again. And uh, from our own throw in, right? We give the ball away, Mane nicks it from him, uh, and then and then Firmino does does well. He kind of scoots across a couple of people, puts the shot back the other way into the corner. Um, not sure Gun can do anything there, but. Um, I don't know. I mean, how, how upset were, or should we be with the defense on that? How much should we just applaud Mane for doing the same things that we want our forwards to do? Um, I don't know. Where, where, where do you stand on all of that? Um, well, the thing is, Mane is a great player and I, it actually showed me how much we missed him. And I mean, we had the pleasure of watching him at Southampton and I was gutted when he went. I mean, he, he was an on and off player, but he's, his quality sometimes is just hard to, stop and once Mane's on his run there's nothing you can do really he's a good such a clever player and I actually think this is I think they say about Salah I think Mane for me is the important player because Mane can t- when he turns up he turns up so obviously and I know he's in your fantasy team so I put Mane in instead just saying <laughs> yeah that's fine that's fine I mean Mane had the uh I think they were on the same number of Premier League goals last season um, him and Salah. So, I mean, they're, they are, he's, he's great. And it's, I mean, I still remember that game when he was so big and instru- influential and instrumental in the comeback that we had against Liverpool. Um, I was kind of hoping for the reverse of that. Uh, and, and, and he actually, I think apologized for, for scoring or not for scoring, but for, uh, you know, he said, he's sorry he had to do it against us, but he's got a job to do. And I totally appreciate that. Um, when when Liverpool went to no love, I mean, you could see there was a little was some frustration on Ralph, and and I had the sudden feeling of this. I mean, the scoreline could be the exact same thing that it was last week, and I think that if it happens, um, you say, well, at least we have forty five minutes to build on, you know. But we had that moment, that twenty minutes or so of uh, of time where we didn't look very good, and Ralph made all the changes that he made, um, and, and all of them were offensive, which I thought we needed because we we're trying to get back into the game. Um, and, and we got to see from there, the, uh, the introduction of Genevo for the first time. And I don't know. I mean, what did you make of his Premier League debut? I think his first action was to, to close down the opposition and win the ball back. Yeah. He's a very clever, and I must admit, you can see him being, I don't know what's the right way of putting it, but I think he'll win a lot of fouls during the season because he seemed to, once he come back, got on the pitch, he got tackled a few times and managed to get... I think Mane and him had a few uh, interactions on the pitch. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think yeah. I mean, it's still he still as alluded to with Adams. He had the whole preseason. Janae Pro's obviously a little bit behind, but he's there's excitement there in him. I think a couple more games, and once he gets suited, I think we'll start to see the player that everyone's talking about. But yeah, he's definitely he does excite me, and I'm really hoping we'll get to see the best of him soon enough. Yeah, there was once where he got fouled or t- the ball tackled away and I think his leg caught underneath him and then he rolled. He did almost like a Neymar 
esque role, uh, which I thought like, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to see that, but uh, we'll we'll see. How, I mean, he's young; he's got time to learn, uh, you know. And also, it's guys like me who's just like stop that and let it let, really do whatever you want. You're way better than than everybody talking about you. So, so go with it. Um, eventually, uh, we get to the the Ings goal. Who he just closes down Adrian. I think it's just a terrible mistake from Adrian uh, to, to do that and, and good for Ings for closing them down, doing what we need. And that that's how you get goals that way. Um, Gineppo's booked. And then uh, I think really the thing we have to talk about is Valerie kind of laying that ball on a plate, uh, right across the six yard box. All it needs is a touch and we're level. And there are three guys, there's Ings there who misses it. Um, and then Armstrong and, and James Ward are behind him. And there's just at the end of it, there's three, three distraught looking white dudes holding their heads uh, head and hands uh, wondering how none of them got a, got the touch that was necessary. Uh, and, and unfortunately as of, as a result of that, we're, you know, we lose out on all the points. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause obviously when we saw rings running in, we thought two, two, here we go, got a point and no. Uh, so, so yeah, so it was, it's a shame really. I thought, I mean, looking back on it, I'm sure Ings has got a nightmare. And, and as with Adrian, that that mistake was coming from him. He, it's a shame that we didn't get that earlier because we uh, kept doing that to him because he we knew he was going to be like that. He's, I mean, at West Ham, I didn't watch West Ham a lot, but he used to be like that a lot of West Ham, hence why he got released in the summer. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a shame, but, I mean, we, it could, like you said, it could have been worse. We could have been looking at a Burnley result after conceding so I suppose without I know it's a loss but it could have been worse if that makes sense yeah no no I think I think there are de- some definite positives to take out of the, out of the match and especially the first half and knowing that even a team as good as Liverpool that we can dictate the game going forward and I think that's something that we've been lacking um the past couple of seasons where we always seem to be reacting reactive I should say um we look at the way the opposition is likely to set up. We look at the what they can do, and we are setting up our situ our 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 team, and we're setting up our team to kind of counteract that instead of really deciding this is how we're going to play football, and we have the guys that are good enough to do this. So here we go. Um, and unfortunately, though, I, I'm just not sure we have the back four to be able to do it uh, with the, the with the, the formation that Ralph would want ideally, but. The the idea that we can go out and press Liverpool and force them to make mistakes and and, and nearly come away with with points, I think we'll take a uh, we'll take a lot from that. Um, it doesn't it doesn't actually get you anything. It doesn't doesn't win you any points. It doesn't mean you're going to be safe this this season. Um, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to do it again next game. But I think it's something that that Ralph will can build on. And I think as much as he has the guys watch film and things, I think they, they're, we're going to see those things and see where we can improve and. You know, uh, I think we had the third youngest starting lineup in the Premier League uh, last week in the opening week of the season. And, and uh, I would say maybe it got slightly older because we had we had Yoshida in there. Um, but at the same time, uh, Hoiberg was in there as well. And Ings, who I think is actually a little bit older, was out as well. So maybe it, maybe it, maybe we're still there. And I think that you you think of the the mistakes we made that young defenders make mistakes. That's what happens. So, uh, you know, you, you, you live and learn, but um, I, I don't know. You, you want to jump into some questions now? I think we have some questions that'll help us kind of sort through the rest of this. Yeah. One thing I was just going to say as well, if you don't mind me saying was, I was just going to say about the tribute that we did for Justin Gladys, right, right, right. The, the PA man. Um, obviously I was just going to say it, it was so sad I must admit that was one thing about the game. Reading about the sad news of his passing was obviously des- uh, devastating. He was getting ready for his 19th season, and I just wanted to say on behalf of Southampton players, and obviously you, our thoughts go out to his family and friends, and obviously we send our best wishes to them all at this tough time. Yeah, absolutely, and it's a, it's a, it's not easy, and it's terrible, and you never want that to be. Yeah, you you don't want that to happen to anybody. And I realize that I'm sitting here as a, you know, I'm sitting in California doing a show about a team that I like and I've never met the guy, but it's it's a it's a big loss to the family that is Southampton, you know? Like we you and I have never met in person, but we spend a lot of time talking to each other. We spend a lot of time talking about the team and and doing these things and so to 
to lose a member of the, of the collective family, I think is always difficult. And I can only imagine what it's like for his, his family right now. And, and knowing that he should have been sitting in the booth yesterday, um, you know, pushing the guys forward and helping the fans get into it and everything else, I think is a huge, is it, is it, it's a huge miss. And maybe it was a, a, a sense or a source of us, um, you know, pushing forward and hopefully, you know, more, ho- hopefully this doesn't get forgotten. You know, hopefully this is something that's remembered. 18 years is a long, long time to, to be a part of something. And, and now that's, that's gone. And I know there's a lot of people that probably work at the club who's, who were missing that. And it was, it was wonderful of the fans to be able to celebrate him yesterday. Yeah. And the thing with Justin is you, you, I mean, I went, obviously you've been to St. Mary's, I've been to St. Mary's. You would, you would remember his voice, the passion he showed for the job. He was a Southampton fan. He loved the club. He, he had the job where, where people would love to do it. You would, he was doing something that he could do passionately. And it's, as you said, it's so sad to know that he was, literally talking on the at the beginning of the month that he was going to be doing this for another season to have it taken I mean not to be able to have him doing that as a big loss and he I said his voice was known because there was a I remember reading the tributes online there was a there was tributes from people that have been from the away way fans he, he had that influence on the club and it's so hard because when people say well I wonder who's going to be next it's hard to say who's next because he was such a, a, an amazing bloke it was t- it's tough to follow on from him. So as you said, I'm sure he'll always be remembered, and I hope his memory is kept alive by his legacy at Saints. Yeah, absolutely. And and I know that even the guy who was going to be, uh, who did the job yesterday, uh, who stepped up and and was in that in that spot yesterday, had you know posted something on Instagram or Twitter saying you know he was honored to be able to do it and he would be doing it for Justin, you know, and that he, you know, wished he could be doing it alongside him. And, and I think that, I I think that just shows what it, what it means to people and and what Justin meant to people. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that, like you said, I I hope that his legacy kind of lives on and people will remember that. And, you know, for a lot of people, I mean, if you've gone, I mean, I guess if you're probably between the ages of five and, and 25, that's, Justin's the only voice you you know from from Southampton, so maybe that's 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 that. So um, uh, we do have some questions on on the game, and I guess we'll we'll move on and try to discuss those, even though they are you know much less important than than uh, what we've been talking about with Justin. But um, just to to lighten the mood just a little bit, uh, Dan, who's at Holy Hoiberg, asks uh, now that he's left the country, he's coming back to the United States now. Uh, he's been over there for uh, the, some of the preseason games, and then now says, "How many games will we win in a row now that I've left?" So uh, we got Brighton and then Manchester United for sure coming up next. Um, do we win either of those games? Um, uh, well, so, well, for one thing, I'm gonna say I'm glad you've left, Dan, because you are a bad influence. Um, <laughs> for one, uh, no, but no, j- jokes aside, um, Brighton. I think we need to win. Do I think we're going to win? I don't know at this current moment because I'm a bit. I, I'd like to. I think we need to leave there with something. I think a win's needed. I mean, a point's not the worst, but then we've got to think about Manchester United after, and there's a big question mark that we could end this month with zero points, which for a club in the league to start full get yes I'm not saying I'm not saying it's doomsday before anyone has a go at me for this but to end the first month of the season with zero points is not a good look and it doesn't set a good precedent for the rest of the season personally but I don't know what you think about that no I mean it's 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 a tough situation you know and the 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 home start especially was going to be tough and I think that if Ralph had not built up so much goodwill with the fans that we'd be in a much worse spot I think if we have this start last season under Hughes, um, season before under Pellegrino, season before under Puel, I think things are are turning toxic quickly. That said, there are not very many people out there who are who are kind of getting on House and Hoodle's case. I think he managed Burnley a, a little awkwardly. Uh, I think he did much better against LFC, and I, I think going forward, I think we're going to be I think we're going to be okay. It'll just take some time, and we we knew like we needed players in the in the transfer window. We didn't necessarily get everyone we wanted, but. It's going to take some time for, for these things to fit in. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But um, 
Jem, who's at FTBL Jem, so at Football Jem, says Valerie and Bertrand both look too comfortable in their respective positions. Do we start Cedric? Do we give Vokins a chance or Vokins a chance? Uh, discuss. Um, my thing with this is yesterday, Valerie, in one moment, puts in the cross that should have leveled the 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 score right like Ings needs to put that away um and then but then at the end of the game i think valerie gave the ball away like three times in 30 seconds when we really needed to keep the ball and keep possession he kept giving it away and then we would gain it back and he gave it away and and, and so on and so forth and then it was just that was frustrating because that's one of those times where you just need to to find a pass or or get the ball deep to somebody or do anything but just smash it at the guy directly in front of you and i thought it was uh, i don't know i was i was i was pretty frustrated with that but i don't know that we have an option that is better than than valerie or bertrand and i don't think starting them in a game when we like we said we are in danger of going into the international break with zero points i don't think starting them in a game where we think we could at least take a point is going to be a, a a good option and by that i mean starting somebody else other than valerie and bertrand yeah, I mean, uh, I wanted, uh, I, I did want Cedric to come in, maybe to see how he does. But it's one of them. But Cedric's not exactly the. I'm not saying he's bad at all, but he's still. I think Ralph's still on unsure on on him, and Valerie is a mixed bag, and people seem to forget he's still a youngster, as you alluded to. He's a young defender, yes. He's frustrating, and yes, people will be trying to pick. And I said he's in the. And don't get me wrong, he's in the Premier League, and he should be getting scrutinised for doing the wrong things. But he does do some good things, and that's the problem. Is for me is it's it's all well and good changing the defence all the time, but you need that solid base. And if he thinks that Bertrand and Valerie are his main number ones, then that's what Ralph thinks. And I like Vokins, but is I. We haven't seen enough of him really to see if he's ready to step on. I mean, Ralph used him in pre-season, but it's a risk, isn't it? I mean, like you said, you can't... Because Vokins might come in, let's say, against Brighton and, and get absolutely ruined and, nev- and never be seen again. Or he could come in and be the best left-back that we've ever seen. It's a risk, isn't it? And you don't know how to play it both ways. And I can see the arguments for both ways on it as well. Yeah, it's... I, I think that where you challenge those guys is in training. You you all of a sudden maybe let Vokins step in with the the side that is maybe clearly the first team side and make Bertrand play on the other play the other way. You know, you you force him to um, just kind of give him a look in or, or bring Vokins in for more reps on on certain things. Or you do that with Cedric as well. And I think that sends a message. Um, you know, the manager can talk to them and say, look, like you know. You, your your spots are not guaranteed, and I'm pretty sure that every, I, I'm pretty sure it seems like everybody knows that. Like nobody, yeah. I think the only person that gets in the team each and every week right now is, I mean, it has to be Hoiberg, right? That, that that's it. That everybody else, good luck, you know. Um, and and yeah, I think I think that's I think that's kind of where we're at on that. Um, and it'll be interesting to see who he how he makes changes and and. Maybe maybe Vokins is okay or better if we if we play a back four, but I don't I don't think so. I think I think we're I think Bertrand's the best the best left back, and I think Valerie is both the most promising and probably the most uh, or the best right back for for the, how we're playing right now. Um, and I mean, and there's still a chance that Cedric could go somewhere, but before the end of this transfer window, we still have you know a, a week plus left in that. So. Um, Harry, who's at FFS Harry, uh, asks, how many games do you think it'll be before Rock goes to a four at the back, and how long would you leave it, or would you just stick with the back five? Um, well, I'm, see, I'm unsure about the five at the back, to be honest with you. Uh, I, things I like, I do like the wing, I like the right wing back and the left wing back, but it's the three defenders. I mean, Bednarak, uh, well, what was it? It was Bednarak, Yoshida, and Vestergaard. I mean, it can work, but I'm I'm more of a traditional four at the back person. I like two centre backs, right back, left back. That's what I always think. I prefer to see a partnership. I don't know, but then but then you have got to think about it this way. He's got so many. I'm, I'm not saying he does it because of it because of this, but you think he's got? I, I might be wrong on this number, but he's got six centre backs at the moment. <laughs> 
So, and who would you want? Someone would have to miss out if you did four at the back. Do you think you've got? Because, but Bar Bednarik, have we really got someone that's a prominent centre back at the moment? There isn't really, is there? No, no, that, and that's the that's the problem is we don't have two standout kind of centre backs that can come in and and really establish themselves and be the the guy or the person that's that's there. I mean, you think of when we played for a back four, which is you know, mostly traditional. And, and sometimes under Kuman, we even went uh, with, with the back five, but think back to when we had the back four, Oliver Wild and, and font, um, you had Van Dyke and font. I think you had Lovren and font, um, you know, occasionally Yoshida had to fill in there, but you always had somebody back there with some leadership skills. Um, and with that kind of personality that we, that they were there to lead and we don't have that right now. Um, and because of that, I think that, that, that prevents us from playing a back four because you have to cover for, for them. And then you also have to have the, the midfield providing them with some, some shielding. And right now we have Romeu that does that. But I think in front of them for a while, we had Wanyama and Schneiderlin, you know, who, who did a wonderful job of, of playing that. And that, this formation relies on us having a, a fair more bit of, of width. And I think that the, and the wingbacks have to provide that. And so the center backs sometimes are left kind of exposed down the channel where Vestigar doesn't have uh, quite the pace to be able to do that. But um, I don't know. I think the soonest we will see it is if uh, and when Danzo is ready. And when Danzo comes in, I could I could see us potentially uh, going with a, a back four with him and whoever he chooses. And whether that's it's Vestigar, whether that's Bednarak, which I think a lot of us would be OK with, although that is an extremely young center back pairing, you know, uh, and and that could be, I mean, that could be terrible if if it all goes wrong. And then what are we going to say? What are we going to say if, if he chooses to go with two, you know, early twenties center backs, and then we get we get, you know, completely burnt all game. Like nobody in a, in a game that we probably should win because you're not going to do it against, you know, a Tottenham or Manchester United. Probably you're not going to do that against Arsenal. You're going to do it against a team. Maybe Bournemouth, you know, Sheffield United seems soon, too soon to do it, maybe, but that's after an international break, so maybe. Uh, and if you do that and you get and you get completely burned, I think that's I think you're asking for trouble. Yeah, that's the thing. And that's the problem I was just that I was, that was gonna be actually my next point. Like Danzo is uh, as he, I've forgotten his I've actually forgotten his age offhand. I think he's twenty twenty one, isn't mm-hmm. he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well that's the thing. Him and I mean Bednarak is a good defender and we say about I said it's, just, it's one of them because, but, but then you look at Vestergaard, but Vestergaard obviously is not blessed with pace. But and then you've got Yoshida, experience, Bednarak. You, but then you'd say, right, okay, Bednarak, Yoshida, mix of experience, youth. But then, like you said, it's working out the right, and some teams it works against, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, let's take, for example, this is going back. Do you remember when obviously this was in the EFL, you know, when we done Stevens and Van Dyke? Well, everyone was nervous about Stevens, it worked a treat. But then, like you said, we could play against Man United, just going on to the game after Brighton, and do Danzo and Ben right, let's say. And it can go, as you said, go completely wrong. So it's getting that right balance of defence. Yeah, and, and I don't know, it's going to have to happen, I think, behind the scenes. I, I think you have to be super confident when you make that change. You have to be ready to go. And and we've tried the four two two two. Um, in preseason, and we never have quite figured it out. And granted, it's all been without Danzo, so um, we will have to see. But I'm not necessarily willing to bet that you know a 20 or 21 year old center back who's new to the league is going to magically solve everything. I don't think that happens. Uh, not very often, at least. But we will, we will see. Um, all right. Do you see any questions on here that uh, you uh, would like to answer next? Um, let's have a look. Uh, let's, oh, there's a couple on one from Alfie saying, "What does Boothell? I'm sorry, I'll say his name properly. What does Boothell have to do to be given another chance on that one? Um, I don't know if you want to go with that one first. Yeah, no, that's that that's fine. I think it's a it's a decent question, and and we have. I mean, I mean, along those lines. Or maybe slightly different, but same position. Maybe is is should Janepo be starting after yesterday's performance? Into that question, uh, let's see who asked that. Just so we can give them some credit here, uh, Ollie Wren. Um, I would say that that Janepo probably shouldn't be starting, and I'm not sure what Buffal is going to have to do because Buffal came on against Burnley and looked pretty good. 
Uh, he looked decent in preseason, but Janapo looked fantastic yesterday um, as a young player. And he came in, he pressed, he made tackles, uh, he got booked, he got injured, uh, all of the things that you could imagine that would happen as a as a as a young player in your first game. I think he you did it you did it all except for score. Um, but I mean, for Buffal to come in and play last week against Burnley and then not make the bench this week is slightly concerning. Maybe that means a move is imminent. Um, but I think he's if he's gonna. I think he's going to have to overcome a lot. I think I think he's starting almost on negative ground, having not been around and been sent away by the club before. And so for him to come in and, and really earn a spot for uh, in Hassan Hudel's team, he's going to have to do a lot because we we are stacked in those positions. You think Armstrong wasn't even on the bench last week? Uh, you think um, he's got to get? He's not going to start over Redmond. You know, uh, James Ward Prowse can play uh, push forward more. Um, you have Janapo, you have just a lot of competition for spots at the top of the pitch because you could, of course, push Adams out wide if you wanted, and, and Obafemi can do the same thing, and so could Long. So you have all of these options there, and, and Buffal just maybe doesn't offer quite enough in those positions because Long can also play center forward, and Obafemi can also play center forward, and Ings can also play the number 10 or center forward. Um, and so you have all these guys that can do multiple things, and, and Buffal is kind of this lone operating kind of winger where he he needs the ball at his feet with either isolated one-on-one or in some space to make a move on somebody and that's not really kind of what you see us getting a lot of i mean there were instances yesterday where redmond was isolated with a defender with ox but that's not the the norm and so uh for us to to be able to to do that i'm not sure i don't know i'm almost i guess i'm saying that he's not i'm not sure he fits the system well enough to be really given another shot yeah it was funny actually on Bufal, that Ralph was asked about Bufal's future and him coming back and that during his press second half of the press conference. And I was listening to his views and it seems um, he does like him and he said that he impressed him against Burnley. Obviously, he said this before he played, he'd done the Liverpool lineup. So I thought, OK, he might be on the bench. But the problem is, as you said, it's a very stacked position because you think about it. I know he's not actually playing and everyone's probably got he's still here we've got Elanusi as well who's still I mean he's not part of the plans at all I'm not, do you know what I mean? but we've got and that's the reason obviously Sims left as well it's a very stacked position if you think about it and then he's and because of the money I don't know what I was going to say well, it's, well it's not always about money but because of the money we put into Janabra you can't really say right okay we'll leave him out and let Bufal have a go because Bufal was on that list of behind because obviously Cedric Wesley Sorry, Hoy, sorry, and him all come back, didn't they? Second, obviously, in the summer. So, Bufel, for me, I think he's, Ralph likes him. It's just a matter of can he get into the squad? But then it's the bench. You've got to look at the bench because you don't want to keep, because otherwise you could just pile loads of wingers on the bench, couldn't you? Do you know what I mean? And, but then there's no room, there's no room for Shane Long at the moment because there's a question on that that we'll get to on that in a minute about him. But there's so much different spots to fight for not everyone can get in and he did say after as well the game on players missing out it was purely tactical so take that as what you will on that as well I guess the ones that missed out also the, the squad is just huge you know there are players all over the place as you mentioned with with Eli Nussi and hopefully like hopefully some of them move on because they're not all going to play there and they can't play and some of them are not quite probably good enough to get into the team now um, and that's fine. That's you, you find that out sometimes, and, and that's just the way it goes. But um, all right, well, I'm not sure we have time to answer all of these, but people can send in questions always on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook uh, to the show. Look for the the post that goes out usually on a Saturday if we're recording on a Sunday, um, and or, or you can just send them over via DM or email uh, or use the contact page at SouthamptonDelivery.com. But um, one thing that patrons of the show who do support the show uh, monetarily get uh, in, in, in kind of as a thank you for that is access to a private group chat and then also access to uh, or, or I guess um, they, they, they get priority for having their questions answered. So uh, Kevin McGee, um, first of all, corrected my, uh, my geographic uh, assessment of where the power outage was uh, earlier today in Southampton. Uh, and then also said, um, do you need wingbacks if you are playing actual wingers? And 
And I guess if we are playing with a kind of a wide front three, you know, do you need to play the wing backs or, and does this play into our kind of thing of, you know, could we go with a back four? I, I don't see Ralph going with like a, a four, three, three. I don't think that's his style, but um, you know, do you, do you see a problem with us playing kind of two wide players with Janapo maybe and, uh, and, and Redmond with, with Adams or Ings through the middle and then also having the wing backs play? Yeah, I think it's quite tough with that. Like you said, it's quite a, I don't think Ralph likes to do that really. And thinking about it, I mean, how, and I said, and it's changing the whole dynamic. And, and there's so many, as you said, there's so many interchanging people, isn't there? Like on the wings, and it's hard to do. And it's whatever formation we do, because we go so, do so many different formations. It's actually. It's actually um quite confusing sometimes when you see us go from one formation to another, but yeah, it's uh yeah, and I, and I was just gonna say as well quickly on that question where he's actually talking about is where I used to live actually for twenty four years, so I know what you're talking about. I thought I'd just get that bit in there. Oh yeah, yeah. well I'll, I'll tell you on the on that chat we were talking about the uh, the power outage that you mentioned, and I just said it's Hamble and Rice or something like that, and he goes it's Hamble, Lee Rice. And it's yeah. actually, you know, so that that's what it was. I I knew you had moved, but I I could not remember where you moved, so I didn't. It's a very nice place, Southampton, but now I live in Eastley, so that logic sucks all don't work. <laughs> all right. Well, I've been yeah. wrong. I'm sure we I'm sure we are wrong on other places on here, or I've been wrong on other places on here, but that's that's okay. Um, all right. Last thing, uh, we have uh, we we kind of answered um, I think Jenny Marshall's uh question about Shane Long. I mean. Do you, did we? I mean, there's a lot of competition. Do you see him having a, a place? I think we talked about it earlier, but maybe we should just revisit it real quickly. Yeah, it's um, I must admit it's a weird one because Long's missed out on the last two now, and the strikers, as I look at it, is obviously the reason this is why at, at Austin left. Uh, and we've got Offerfemi, Ings, and Adams. Redmond can play up top, as you said, and all that sort of stuff. So it's a weird one for Shane Long. But then I can't. I don't know. Because I wouldn't be surprised if Long's out for a little while. He doesn't. I don't know when we play Fulham, but I could imagine him featuring then. But then, but then he's not a person I could see. Because obviously, I know you, you know you said about transfer window. I don't think he's one that he wants to move on. But it's a bit of a weird one. He keeps getting left out. I don't think Shane would be happy with that. And I, I'm sure his contract is um, expiring this year. So it'd be interesting to see if he does feature or Ralph's looking more at Upper Femi than him. I don't know. But the logic on that one. Well, I mean, the problem is kind of that there there are enough other players like him now. We have people with pace. We have people that can press and, and do that stuff. And uh, before, when it was, you know, Austin or him or Carrillo, like those players couldn't do that. And so now we have players that can do that and that are probably better finishers. So uh, we will we will see um, kind of how that, how that goes. And I'm just going to look real quickly to see... When exactly his contract runs out? Uh, 2020 is when he's done. So yeah, so he's yeah, done so, at the end of this this season. Um, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see what happens on that because, like I said, for me, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if he looked if depending on what happens in the, from now till January. If because obviously I'm, I know normally you can talk to people, can't you? If you're six months in January, so if yeah. he's not getting. In, I could imagine him sorting himself out a move in January if he's not part of the plans. I don't know. Sure. I mean, he might come back and play. He might come back next game and be in there for the. But I don't. But I think this could be his last season with us, yeah. and I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Put yeah. It out. Um. Last one because we do have a, a a friend in the Danny Ings fan page, and we will forgive uh, them for being Liverpool fans. But um, they have been great to I think you and I online and and all of that. And um, I don't know. Do you have thoughts on on Mane? celebrating the goal i know sometimes people don't say don't celebrate against your former team um he scored that goal the the quotes afterwards i think kind of maybe softened a little bit but i didn't i don't have a problem with what he did afterwards i don't think it was so so bad and and, and what he did but did you make anything of it um i actually it's funny actually i actually did a tweet about it yesterday because i just said oh, i'm not really fussed about celebrations um i mean he players these days normally go to their old team leave like do whatever and go but he for him to come out with a quote saying i'm sorry he didn't need to he's, he's at a new club he's where he's playing for liverpool 
he didn't need to come out and say what he did. I don't think he needed to justify the fact, but it's a nice thing to do. He he celebrated, and I mean, people said, yeah, but Ings didn't celebrate. Let's be fair, the goal was no offence to Ings, but it's not the best goal he scored. He picked the ball up. Took it back to. Well, I mean, you can't really celebrate that. It was Adrian Day. Well, and we're down. We're down two nothing with with limited yeah, time remaining. If he goes off and celebrates, he's wasting minutes that where yeah. we could be trying to win the game. So like he, there's no reason for him to celebrate. Mane scores when his team has, you know, traveled halfway across Europe uh, midweek, won that game, come back, uh, have not looked great, been down, uh, been pressed, been pressed back. Uh, finally, they get a chance and he puts it away, and it's a gr- it's a great goal. Like, you know, he does those things like that's that's one of the goals that we would have all been celebrating had he done it for us or any of our players have done it. And so for him to celebrate, it's com- like the, the context is completely different. And he didn't run knee slide, you know, in front of the away fans. He didn't do anything like that. He's he's excited to score a goal. And if you're not excited to score a goal, then you probably shouldn't be playing. No, that's what I mean. And he and it didn't really bother me. I mean, players, some I mean, some players do put their hand up and go not celebrating. Fair enough. That's up to them. People celebrate when they score. I mean, going back to, I think this was before everyone wasn't the best fan of him. Even Austin said when he left clubs, he didn't see the point of not. I mean, he just celebrated whenever he scored a goal. And that's, I I agree with him on that. I think it shouldn't matter who you're playing. If it's your former team, yes, okay, you can. I mean, you can see your mate after and go, nice to see you again, mate, and all that sort of stuff. But I don't think it should be an issue. Like you said, he scored a good goal. He didn't go. I mean, if he would have done an ad by all celebration, if you remember that against Man City when he done the whole. Do you remember? Did you ever see that when he done the whole run of the pitch and yes. he slides in front of the fans? Yes. <laughs> I mean, he didn't do that, did he? So I think everyone just needs to, no offense, just get over it because he he celebrated. He didn't go over the top. Scored a good goal. Game's over. Move on. Move yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't think we can be upset there. No. But I mean, I think we could be upset that we didn't take a point away, but I think we could also be super positive yeah. in the fact that we played that. I mean, it, obviously it's early in the season, but that's the best game we've played. We've looked better there. We look a hundred times better there than we did during any part of Burnley and during most of preseason, just because the competition level was there and we, we were up for it. And I think that's, that's good for us going forward. So um, I'm not sure if there's anything else that you wanted to cover or if we are done, we've gone, I don't know what's going to happen. We've had quite a few interruptions. Uh, so my timing here, we'll see how that, we'll see how it all works out. But um, I don't know anything else you want to add before we wrap this up. Yeah, I mean, I've seen one question, but I don't think it needs justification. I don't think I don't know if I, I mean, I'm not, I've seen it and we've spoken about it, so I think we'll just leave that question to, yeah. I don't you think mean, I you don't think that people want to know whether or not you think cereal is soup? <laughs> yeah. To be fair, I think we could probably do another hour of podcast just on that subject itself. So, but. I, don't, I mean, how do you even answer that? Do you count it as soup? <laughs> well, I've actually had to go Google and look for the definition of soup. And it's generally hot, and it generally involves some sort of broth coming to a boil uh, and cooking something in it. And I'm never boiling soup. I've never no, boiled soup. No. I've never boiled no. a cereal. I like my cereal cold. I do yeah, eat I stale don't... cereal because I eat the cereal that kids leave for weeks or months sitting in the box and don't finish it. But uh, I would say no. I would say it's not soup. Yeah, I would say that as well because I don't... I mean, I've had soup, tomato soup, and I've never thought, oh, cereal. So... <laughs> well, not everything with... I guess soup, Soup. I mean, uh, at one level is, is a liquid that has some solids in it, right? Whether it's noodles or meat or whatever. But just because it's liquid and has a solid in it, doesn't mean one that it's soup and it doesn't mean you should eat it. I mean, if you leave milk long enough, it'll eventually get some solids in there and you don't want to eat that. So like, I would say, no, I would say, no, it's not soup. Any, it's not anything more. If cereal is soup, then Dejan Lovren is a good defender. And that's just not true. And I'll tell you what, that's the best thing I've heard all day. So <laughs> We'll end on that then. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thank you so much, Jay. And once again, people can find you at Southampton page on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. The links are in the show notes. We'll talk to you next time. Yeah, thank you for having me again. That does it for this episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. 
Special thanks this week goes out to Jay from the Southampton page. Thank you for all of the support from day one. Thanks for being the official partner page of the show. Thanks and good luck on your new journey. YouTube, I think it will be good for everyone from the fans to you. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So uh, cheers to the new adventure. If you want to follow the Southampton page, you can do that at Southampton page on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. The links are in the show notes and the link to their YouTube channel, as I mentioned before, is there as well. So go check it out. Subscribe if you're into that sort of thing. And I kind of imagine you are since you're here. If you want to follow this show on social media while you're there, you can do that. We're at SFC D-E-L-L underscore I-V-E-R-Y on both Twitter and Instagram. We're at facebook.com forward slash SFC delivery on Facebook. There's no underscore in the Facebook address. The show also has a website with links to all of those things and more, including a sign up for the weekly newsletter that goes out each and every Friday at 815 in Britain. The website URL is southamptondelivery.com. Links are in the show notes and hopefully you enjoy what you see. You'll come back and you'll check it out. You'll share it with a friend. It's really the easiest way to do it and other things you can do there. You can subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, or wherever you get your podcast directly from the website. Uh, we've tried to make it super, super easy. And by we, I mean I. I don't know why I say that. There's a very small but mighty group of people who support the show via patreon.com at patreon.com slash SFC delivery. And to them, I am forever grateful. Uh, they get access to a private chat and they get priority for having their questions answered each and every week on the show. And some of them get an extra podcast episode per month. And to them, like I said, uh, this show would not be possible without them at this point. So thank you so much. And thank you to you, the listener right now who's listening, uh, because really the show wouldn't be possible without you either. The logo for the show is designed by Matt Beeling. The Southampton page is the official partner page of the show. The music comes courtesy of the Free Music Archive at freemusicarchive.org. The intro song is Epic Song by Box Hat Games, and the intro show credits that you're listening to right now is Aim is True by Ponington Bear. So that does it for now. We will see you next week, and until then, remember that together, we march on.